All right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce our very distinguished panel of, um, you know, um, researchers and academicians from all different um, parts of, of robotics and computer vision sectors. Um, first one is, hold on a second. So I'm just gonna briefly introduce them. Uh, they are in alphabetical order by last name. Um, Professor Narendra Ahuja, he is uh, formerly a, a professor at um, ECE at Urbana-Champaign. And he is, um, he is also one of our alumni from 1979, one of the very original uh, in computer vision. Uh, he is also the founding director of Information Technology and Research Academy, which enable all type of really innovative application of computing in rural health, transportation, disaster management, sustainability, agriculture, um, and food by 16 teams um, across the country. And he is also the 1999 IEEE Emil um, Pior Awards, uh, 1998 Technology Achievement Award, by the International Society of Optical Engineering. And actually the list goes on and on and on. I won't go into all the detail, uh, but he, he has also received one of the UNC, uh, I'm sorry, UMD CS Alumni Hall of Fame awards, given uh, his incredible accomplishment. Uh, he also have NSF uh, PYI. He's a fellow of IEEE uh, and the Triple AI and, and many, many other society. Uh, the next panelist is Professor um, and Dr. Uh, Jim Billingham. Uh, he is currently the director of Assure Autonomy at Johns Hopkins University, uh, just our neighbors, not far away <laughs> from here. And he, um, he received his PhD at MIT. He is a pioneer in uh, autonomous marine robots. And, and he is also currently the Bloomberg Distinguished Professor of Exploration Robotics with a joint appointment in Mechanical Engineering and Applied Physics Lab. Um, he is also the founding director of a consortium of marine robotics at Woods Hole um, Oceanography Institute uh, before joining um, Johns Hopkins. And then even before then, he actually had a very, very long career uh, in underwater robotics. Um, from Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute to MIT Sea Grants and Roofing Robotics. Um, he is also an NAE member. Uh, he received a numerous um, awards as well. Next is our local here. That's Professor Dinesh Manocha. Uh, he received his PhD from Berkeley. Uh, he was, before joining Maryland, he was a distinguished professor at UNC Chapel Hill. He had received numerous paper award. And one of the most recent one is his uh, test of time award uh, at IEEE CRA. He also received I uh, he also received IT Delhi Distinguished Alumni Award, Sloan Fellow, ONR Young Investigator Award, NSF Career. He's a fellow of ACM IEEE, um, Triple AI and Triple AES and, and more. Um, and then the next is also another one of our own and that is Ani uh, Kempati. He is actually a Larry Davis's a PhD student from a while ago. And he, he, um, he is also currently an associate professor, affiliate associate professor at the University of Washington. Um, before joining um, uh, Allen Institute of AI, where he is currently the senior director of computer vision, he also worked at Microsoft Bing and building very large scale efficient machine learning system in image and video search. Um, he have received several best paper award. This is including uh, most recently from CVPR just this year and outstanding paper awards at you know different conferences and also NVIDIA Pioneer Paper Award. Okay, the next is uh, Dr. Brett Piakowski and he is also one of our alum Nye from mechanical engineering. And this, um, so we, we really have quite, we are trying to feature our alumni here. Um, he received um, his PhD from mechanical engineering. He is the um, cooperative agreement managers of ARL's uh, micro autonomous system and technology. Um, 
and and this is part of the collaborative technology alliances which leads the industries um you know and and armies is basic research program with 15 academic institution performing research to enable uh, small and collaborative autonomous um, systems for enhanced soldier awareness. And he, before that, he was um, manager of ARL's uh, specialty electronic material and sensor cleaning research facility, as well as MEM researcher, and, um, and also in electronic um, technology and prior to that large number of accomplishment. All right, so today we are going to ask them to talk about, uh, first of all, I'm gonna pass the floor to them and they are going to just give their sort of look back on robotics and computer vision in the last uh, few years or decades and then looking forward to the future. All right, um, so I believe Jim has videos. So I'm gonna go ahead and Ask talk. Can you switch to the PowerPoint slides for Jim? Talk. So uh, while he's finding my slides, I'll just start go. out by saying that I'll, I'll be talking about vision in the ocean, uh, and it's kind of a different environment. So I thought that actually it would be helpful if I showed you a few slides. Uh, or a few movies actually to give you a sense of I'm going to I'm going to be talking about vision in, in the ocean and uh, to do that I kind of have to introduce you a little bit to the ocean as an operating environment um, so one of the really interesting things about the ocean environment is it's actually filled with life uh, and in many respects that's kind of one of the primary reasons why we're interested in using vision in the ocean environment is fundamentally as a scientific tool there's a lot of surprises associated with this. So I spent a lot of time running vehicles in the ocean, looking forward uh, from the vehicle as we ran into what looked like an empty ocean, um, only to have a friend of mine, uh, Amy Kukulia, share the video on the next, uh, next slide here uh, with me, where she studied cameras all over her vehicles. And uh, here's her, one of her vehicles launching from the surface as it dives uh, on this backward looking camera, what you can see is a whole school of fish following the vehicles. Now, I, I tell you, if you were looking out of the front of this vehicle, the ocean would look empty. Uh, and I've asked biologists, uh, what's going on here? And uh, they've told me, well, maybe they think it's a predator and they're safest behind it. Maybe they think it's a mama fish. They don't know. And so the kind of the, the interesting aspect of working in the ocean is it's full of questions and it's full of surprises, uh, kind of, and a lot of times uh, it's not just about uh, having the right sensing technology, it's actually pointing it the right direction. Next slide. Uh, one of the things that you really need to understand about the ocean is it's enormous. So here we are looking at the Pacific from space and basically all you can see is ocean. Uh, it's 70% of the planet. Uh, what you're looking at there is an average of about three and a half kilometers deep. So it's an enormous habitat, produces a good chunk of the oxygen we breathe. Uh, it basically determines the chemical composition of the atmosphere. Uh, and it actually has a, a large role and poorly understood uh, role in global climate. Next slide, please. So the way that we actually study it uh, increasingly is with robots. Uh, it's been ships historically, they're very expensive. So uh, both of these classes of systems here are ones which I've had a lot of experience with. The one on the left is an AUV, looks like a torpedo, it's not. It carries scientific sensors, it goes slowly. The one on the right is an ROV, a remotely operated vehicle that carries cameras. And you see the video there, that video is the ROV taking a video of the AUV. And you'll see as the AUV gets further away, it begins to fade out and it turns blue. And that has to do with uh, the light propagation characteristics of the ocean. So one of the things that's happening there is there's particulates there and they're scattering and they're preferentially scattering and absorbing red. Um, and and the, blue is, uh, the blue and the green is making it through. And that's noise in the context of this. And I'll come back to that. Next slide, please. So one of the ways that we do work in the ocean is we use acoustics and we tend to sort of replicate our human senses uh, with sound. So here's a vehicle um, which you can see on the, on the right hand side of the screen. It has a sonar which is pointing off uh, the left side of the vehicle. It also has one off the right side. I just didn't draw that. 
And as it looks out to the side and then moves uh, towards the top of the page, it basically maps out the seafloor. And these are really very impressive sensors. So in the middle there, you can see a picture of a shipwreck, which has been detected and mapped by one of these sonars. And so this is the way that we actually look for things in, in the deep ocean. So when you hear about an aircraft getting lost or a ship getting lost at sea, this is kind of the first thing that you'll do, you'll take out there, are these types of sensors to go and look for the, the systems on the bottom. Uh, next slide. Um, once you get, find it, you have to go down to the deep ocean. And for the most part, the deep ocean is pretty boring. It's big mud plains. But every once in a while, you come across, across places like this. In fact, there's a very large mountain range that runs basically, it bands the earth, uh, and is volcanically extremely active. So these are hydrothermal vents. And one of the things you can see here are lots of particulates in the water, these black plumes coming out of the seafloor, and the light fading off in the distance. So one of the ch big challenges you have in the underwater environment is first of all, you have to bring the light with you. It's just dark. It's dark there once you get below about three or 400 meters, and then the rest of it is pretty much pitch black. Now, this is a slide here that kind of shows you, uh, I'm not sure, can you click on that to make this movie run? Um, this is, so those hydrothermal vent systems, a lot of these hydrothermal, these systems in the deep ocean are incredibly fragile. So this is a coral. Um, it's not like a coral reef up at the surface. This is a coral reef uh, on a seamount down at about a kilometer water depth. Uh, these take about a millennia to grow. So if you damage one of these, you're causing damage that isn't going to, that isn't, and by the way, these things are getting trawled away uh, by fish trawls in some parts of the world. And so one of the things that you really want to do is bring back or allow scientists to do measurements on the seafloor without disturbing them rather than bringing up to the surf, uh, bring, uh, you know, damaging them, uh, collecting them and bringing them to the surface. And so you can begin to see sort of some of the uses, uh, this was work with Microsoft Research, in taking an ROV down there and creating very fine scale maps of this deep sea uh, coral. Next slide. So I mentioned those particulates in the water and the haziness. Um, this is just to show you that if, if you look at that top left uh, curve there, there's a vehicle there that's been profiling through the water and it's measured basically both fluorescence in the water, so the type of fluorescence you would expect from chlorophyll, and it's measuring sort of backscatter. And it turns out that this is a very good indicator of the type of particles. So some of those particles are actually just dirt um, detritus, uh, and some of them are actually little animals. And you can begin to tease the difference of these out of the optics. So this is a class of imaging in the subsea environment that begins to tease out what is really, it turns out, the most populous class of organisms on the planet. Next slide, and I'm getting near the end here. So what do those particles look like? Well, a lot of them look like little animals. And these are the little critters that are creating the oxygen we breathe, fixing the carbon dioxide, which is currently in the atmosphere. Um, fixing nitrogen, uh, they're basically determining sort of the, the uh, global chemistry, and we don't really understand them very well, uh, I will say. So predicting, in effect, where they are, how they're going to respond to environmental change is a really big uh, part of what we need to do uh, to, to understand the evolution of global climate. Next slide. And so this is just to say that my last slide, um, we did a lot of work in one of my prior jobs attempting to predict, in effect, where you would find these microorganisms. Um, we weren't always very successful, and so uh, one of the things we decided we'd do is develop a vehicle which would have a docking system that we could leave out there. Uh, now, we wanted to see how close the vehicle got to the dock, so we put a camera on it. We don't normally put cameras on these long endurance platforms, and we got the vehicle back, and this, these tests were literally two, three kilometers offshore. Um, we found these enormous blooms of sea nettles. So these jellies are about uh, two feet, uh, or excuse me, about two meters long. So they're about six feet long. Uh, and they're there in enormous uh, numbers in the offshore environment. So it turns out that this is a class of organism that is almost undetected by our current instrumentation out there at sea. Um, but you can detect it, in effect, via these optical methods. And there's a whole line of work uh, which uh, follows, uh, that follows on this. So I think that's, that's, uh, that's where I'm going to end, but I just wanted to give you a little bit of a whirlwind tour of the story of sort of imaging and light in, in the ocean environment. So, great. So first of all, um, 
wing just the uh, i'm now back uh, at illinois as a research professor um just to add to the information that being gave um what i'm going to do is um, take you through a journey of computer vision from the time the word was coined right in, right on this campus when i was a grad student the team the term computer vision was coined at that time by a team of uh, people in which my advisor professor rosenfeld was um, a primary member um, and i want to do that in the to set the context for where we are going and what maybe we should consider as we move forward so quickly the uh, I, I mean, my, in my um, understanding, and maybe just to limit the window of time, in the 60s, for example, um, when more attention came to image processing, most of the early work was on image enhancement, segmentation, uh, geometric computation, topological computation, um, finding um, uh, components in an image. So very basic image processing operations. Um, in 70s, that continued, but attention slowly uh, started to drift towards um, three-dimensional vision. Uh, by the time 80s came along, 3D vision, vision was really a, a, a major thrust and a lot of people who were doing image processing earlier came to to do 3d vision where you would estimate the depth and the uh, uh, motion and the size and the uh, surface properties and so on um, and so there was a distinct shift in the kinds of things people were doing the kinds of theses that were coming um, in parallel with that there was an interest in connecting computational vision with psychology, neurophysiology, you know. So for example, I spent my first sabbatical in 84 in psychology library, because that's what you used to do those things, you know. Then we observed some illusions, somebody has a lesion in the brain, and how it affects their vision. Do they see color, but not the size, things like that. So can you draw some conclusion, some inspiration? about how you should design your algorithms from those observations, which were not, which were nature's experiments with people, you know, the, um, so there were two major tracks in 80s. You, you do 3D and you also try to connect yourself, your work with what humans might be doing. Okay. Very often it was very shallow relationship. You always saw a little thing that you did, how it can fit with the, you know, explanation of the brain. Um, but there was that, that awareness. Um, so for example, stereo, shape from texture, estimation of lighting direction, um, estimation of uh, material properties of the material of the surface, all of these together. Um, most of these things were done in isolation, not as an integrated thing. Um, and that was kind of lacking. And I think it never really quite got done in the sense that you cannot say that you take the camera in and it will come up with this everything, material properties, shape, characteristic, lighting, and so on. No. That was the vision and dream. In 90s, uh, oh, and then also active vision those days where you were not just receiving um, images, light, but you were actually playing around. You're dynamically illuminating in various probing ways and then receiving in a very intelligent way to, to really look for some, to find something that you are looking for. So navigate, get 3D, navigate further, get 3D, map the whole place, even including those areas that you do not see because you'll move towards it. In 90s, um, okay, another thing that this, along with stereo and the shape from texture, shape from motion, um, these, all of this occupied a lot of hours of computer vision researchers in 90s and 80s and 90s and into 20 into 2000s but 
in 90s then people started to come back to 2d image but this time for the content for the content so faces and and uh, basically pattern recognition I, I i missed to mention that pattern recognition even predated image processing in 60s okay and there was a distinct gap distinct uh, divide between people who are doing images and then computer vision and people who are doing pattern recognition because pattern recognition was statistical mathematical you know syntactic grammars and statistical neighbors and you know minimum dimensionality reduction and so on and those were considered to be more understood and therefore less less ai um and so coming back in 90s those things started to come back a little uh, along in in the context of what we had understood from vision in the previous 20 years um another major thing that happened in 90s was essentially a result of accidents in one of those accidents happened in my lab other people were you know funny way there seems to be a collective mind in in humanity so when somebody does something another person gets the same idea it's hard to say but but yeah a lot of in interest went into building not just probing the scene with lighting and receiving prop you know with appropriate direction and sensors but but manipulating the camera as you get the data not just external parameters but you play around with your sensors play around with the internal camera intrinsics and that active vision started around that time, uh, in those years but cameras started to get built in 90s and that went on for another 15 years or so in 2000s then um, after the uh, 2d uh, beginning happened the return to 2d happened uh, neural networks got more attention then you know they had seen the attention 40s 60s 80s 20 year cycles and this next 20 year cycle was coming um, and you know a lot of work on on neural nets but then the problem always had been that you didn't really know what was going on inside uh, because you gave it input it gave you output and you were happy because you got what you wanted but you could not tell when it will not give what you want and what are the you know limitations and what are the advantages we knew because they, they worked um, with deep learning that went to a different height because now you had lots of computers lots of communication and lots of data and so more or less the old algorithms now were able to give you more impressive results because the search was possible optimization was possible and so um and 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 you know the number of conferences grew from you know small the size of the conferences grew from small to large hundreds to thousands so um so that's really roughly what has happened uh, uh, and for most of the students who are here would they'll probably know the current uh, phase of things which is um, when a student comes for a phd and you want to solve a problem the question is which training network should i use and where is the data so that i can train it this is the modus operandi but pre in the earlier days what people would do is formulate the problem and then do whatever algorithms you need to do develop the algorithms or use existing things and so on um, so in terms of going from here going forward from here um, i think we need to harvest the advantages that neural nets offer to us because in neural nets basically because of all those availability the communication computing etc but if we just keep them as a opaque box not knowing what is as an input output mapping tables or or you know uh, something that can map input to output and if we don't know then um, they will remain opaque although there is now trend to really break that box down into pieces of box you know small boxes and connect them in, un, in known ways. 
so that becomes much more interesting because now you your zone of un uncertainty is limited to smaller boxes not a big convex hull of everything but convex hulls of small pieces now if you push this to the limit as nature does in the quantum computing panel we saw nature does computation at micro 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 nano scales okay but those are much easy, harder to to not predict meaning those are easier to be to trust because their zone is small they're simple but it's a collection of them that gives rise to macro level performances so i think for the students who are now going to do thesis and so on it is worth thinking about that you know if can you formulate the problem first regardless of how you're going to implement it and then bring in the power of neural nets and soon you will know that you have a room full of not uh uh, lines of code, but you have room full of pieces that you know how they have connected. You know them very well because you designed it. Inside that little piece, let the neural net do it, but it will be much more predictable so that the overall system will be more predictable. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So uh, I'm really excited to be here today. So not only uh, an alumni of Maryland, but also Maryland is a, is a key uh, partner, collaborative partner with a lot with Anish and others at the University of Maryland. So I'm uh, excited to continue that partnership. Um, you know, before we I get into some of the thinking back and looking forward piece, I just want to give a little more updated uh, information on me and, and Army Research Lab, if you're not familiar. So Army Research Lab is a basic and applied research laboratory. Our headquarters is just a few miles down the road here in Adelphi, Maryland, but we also have sites about Aberdeen Proving Ground, we have a new robotics research collaboration campus just north of Baltimore, and we have regional sites across the country uh, where we work with universities and industry uh, in all of those locations. Um, but part of that is really to, you know, our goal is really how do we operationalize science. Uh, I'm currently the division chief for the science of intelligent systems. So I have three branches that are focused on ground, air, multi-agent autonomous systems. And we're really focused on how do we see further? So how do we perceive the world? How do we see further? How do we represent information? How do we share that information with other robotic systems? How do we d act faster or, dis or dis make, think faster? So how do we d make decisions faster in real time robots? So as we move through complex environments, we have to really think and make decisions really fast. So how do we do that with complex information and, and couple that with the perception systems? The other is act smarter. So we, we need to be able to not just move from point A to point B, but to move smartly, right? So for the Army, right, I might have something like, I want to move covertly through an environment. So how do I do that? How do I use terrain? How do I use, other, use these features in the environment uh, to, to move covertly? And then a fourth sort of feature is how do I test and experiment better, right? So how do I do data collection, data labeling, uh, experimentation, model update? How do I do that much faster? Uh, how do I do data set uh, curation and collection? How do I do that uh, faster to solve our problems? Um, so as part of that, you know, uh, looking back, you know, thinking of what I'm gonna talk about today, I look back at ARL. So ARL, if you're not familiar, has been doing work in sensors, perception, and autonomous systems since the 70s, right? And really a lot in the 90s and the early 2000s, um, and all the way up through uh, present day. And so I thought there's three distinct phases, and I thought I'd kind of step through those phases um, and then kind of give you some of my thoughts in the end of what some of the existing problems and focus areas are. So if you look back at the early work uh, within Army Research Lab, is really focused on adding the sensors, uh, adding some of the perception, the path planning uh, for ground, off-road ground autonomy. I saw a lot of success there, a lot of work in, maybe too good of work in developing LiDAR sensors. Uh, so the early work was all vision-based, uh, then ARL did a lot of work and others did a lot of work in developing LiDAR sensors, which solved a lot of problems in depth perception and, and representing uh, the world. Probably uh, over time, this, those became smaller and much better and probably too good. So the fact that we sort of became reliant on them um, and to the point now, we're kind of going back and saying, how do we augment that with vision-based sensors? So I think there was a, a gap there in, in, in how we used uh, sensor technology to, to represent the world. Um, and the outcome of that really was we got really, really pretty impressive. You go back and look at the demonstrations in the early 2000s with ground, off-road ground autonomy, pretty impressive. They were able to go through rolling uh, desert terrain uh, out west. They were going through forested uh, trails up in Pennsylvania. Uh, they were able to go through little mount sites, right? Um, you know, they were putting a lot of waypoints down. Uh, they had GPS a lot of times, but still very impressive autonomous solutions. Um, and that spun out things like the DARPA Grand Challenge, the Urban Challenge, 
uh, a lot of uh, other activities really kind of spun out sort of the driverless car industry and that sort of took off, right? In that's sort of the early phase of what we did at Aero. In the mid phase, like around 2008, we sort of pivoted on the research that we did in Aero uh, to two key programs. One of them was the mass program that you mentioned, and I'll, and I'll talk a little bit about that. The other was the robotic CTA. So the robotic CTA, we started looking more at not off-road large vehicles, but robots as teammates. And what does it mean to have a small robot and how does it, how do we couple that with soldiers? So the robotic CTA really looked at how do I add semantic information? How do I represent that? How do I go beyond just geometric information? So they did a lot of pioneering work in that, a lot of pioneering work in natural language and how do I uh, do natural language processing and communication with robotic systems? Uh, and like one of the capstone experiments for there was, for example, was telling the robot, go behind the building uh, that's behind that car and watch the door, right? So they were able to do that, use the robot to understand that it was that building behind this car that it was supposed to go to, it's supposed to go to the back of the building, it's supposed to watch, for, watch a specific uh, entryway. So they were able to complete that, so pretty impressive stuff. Um, and the thing about that was we switched from sort of pushing uh, individual code and advancement in individual code to really integrated experiments about halfway through the program and really building up a repository of solutions. Um, and that really has become a really robust solution for, for ARL. We have our own ground autonomy stack uh, that we share with uh, industry and academia doing research um, and allows us really to look at the interfaces between uh, different solutions, right? So you might have the best perception algorithm in the world, but if it's put into a, an autonomy stack that's not very good, it's not gonna perform well. So, so looking at those interfaces as well as the individual code base is very uh, powerful. Uh, the mass CTA, uh, which was run in parallel between 2008 and 2017, um, that really looked at how do we scale things down, right? So at the time, there's only one or two uh, small US companies in the world, right? And um, we got involved with that. Uh, back in 2010, people like Nate Michael, who was at UPenn, is now a CTO at Shield AI, they were flying uh, UAS indoors, GPS denied, indoor and outdoor, and mapping buildings 13 years ago, right? So pretty impressive stuff. Uh, also looking at how do we scale things down uh, to, you know, given that we have you know, cell phone processors on, on um, the platforms, and um, UPenn at one point actually flew uh, this was like 2012 through 2013, actually flew a UAS with a cell phone, an actual cell phone, as the only sensors, perception, and everything on board, just to demonstrate you know, that we had to scale things down. And that really, I think, drove a revolution in. How do we scale code down? How do we do efficient code and put it on small processors? Uh, and, that, and that sort of resulted in a, in a boom in that type of uh, research and all the UAS uh, companies and, and solutions that you see today and many uh, spin-out companies out of, out of that program uh, to do that. So that was sort of the middle phase on how we scale things down and uh, how we look at sort of the human-robot interaction. And then the third phase was about 2017, 2018, um, uh, with the Army modernization priorities and looking at robotic combat vehicles, next range of combat vehicles, we started looking back at larger vehicles. And, you know, the driverless car industry has done great. A lot of things that we can leverage from that but the off-road autonomy problem was still not solved, right? So we've reinvested over the last five years heavily in developing the solutions to really tackle that problem. And, uh, and a lot of things I think have happened over that span that I think will allow us to be successful. And I have a list of those in a second. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and we have a lot of programs in that space at the moment, right? So we have uh, distributed collaborative intelligence systems program. We have scalable adaptive resilient autonomy program. We have tactical behaviors of autonomous uh, mobility program. We have an AI for mobility maneuver program. Uh, we have your program and an AI for, uh, I can't remember, it's Artemis. Yeah, Artemis uh, program. Uh, that's a joint program that, that we run at, Maryland, or at ARL, a human agent teaming. So there's a lot of efforts in a lot of different uh, spaces that we're going in. Um, but to get back to the ground autonomy piece, we're also really accelerating that and working with the DARPA Racer program. If you're not familiar with that program, I encourage you to go online and look at the results. Really impressive results on high-speed autonomy uh, using a, a Polaris a Razor vehicle in off-road environments. Uh, some pretty impressive stuff in ARL, uh, and a lot of people in my uh, division are heavily uh, engaged in that. So, so why all of that? So I looked at that, and I happened to come across. I can show you these later. So I was looking back at some of the stuff, and I came across two pictures 
that I thought were, you're not gonna be able to see them from back there, but I'll just strive them. One of them is just a group of researchers with a bunch of robots out in the desert, right? And the other one's uh, XUV uh, vehicle running through the desert, followed by a Humvee, right? This picture could have been taken three months ago at the DARPA racer event, because they did similar pictures, right? So I'm like, wow, you know, in my mind, we've really advanced the science, right? We, we have a lot of advancement, but here's pictures from 21 years ago. Uh, and it could have been the same experiment that we just ran in the desert, right? So what's changed, right? What, what's gonna allow us to be successful now? And I think a few key things. One is just the compute powder that we have on board, right? Back when they were doing this, they were really restrained in compute power that they have on board the systems. Uh, and what they could really do as far as algorithms uh, on board to understand the environment, perceive the environment, uh, and react to the environment. Um, and then, of course, there's a, like the explosion in uh, uh, large data, big data, AI, a lot of tools now to do um, semantic understanding and representation of the world. Um, and then also sensors are better, they're smaller, they're more power efficient. So there's a lot of advancements that allow us to do that. So I, and I apologize, I'm going to take all my notes. So this morning before I came over here, I sort of jotted down a few things that I thought, yeah, these are the things that we're still sort of tackling and going forward and I think are things of, of key research and then I'll, I'll end with this, right? So, you know, one is, you know, the, allowing us to have the more compute power, right? We have a lot of multimodal approaches, right? We're not built into one single pipeline. We really can bring in multiple sources, multiple algorithms, multiple approaches to tackle complex problems, right? We can run large, uh, probabilistic stochastic models on systems to really get beyond sort of the old uh, deterministic systems, right? The AI data-driven revolution, of the availability of data sets to train those things have, have really helped us solve a lot of the semantic information. We can now start to think about what we do with the information versus just there's an object in the world and I need to avoid it, right? We're going beyond handcrafted solutions, um, you know, for experiments. Um, you know, traversability and complex terrain is hard. Uh, so, you know, learning from humans, uh, focusing on understanding and uncertainty, uh, looking at risk-aware concepts uh, are things that we need to do, right? And, um, and really looking at resilience, right? And going beyond just moving from point A to B, but, but, but moving with purpose and, and intelligence and developing systems that are resilient can deal with failure in many ways. So that one. Thank you, Brett. So good afternoon. I'm Dinesh Panocha. I'm actually at Maryland with appointments in CS and ECE. I think I'm the only one in the UMD with the red shirt, right? And if you can read at the back, it also says Maryland Robotics Center. So I want to just give an overview of three things. You know, first of all, I've been only here for more than five and a half years, but robotics at Maryland is huge. And actually, it's based in Maryland Robotics Center, which is part of Inter uh, ISR, Institute of System Research in College of Engineering, but involves faculty from at least six or seven big departments, computer science, we are big data players, ECE, mechanical engineering, he's from their A department, and even you know, other biomedical engineering. So it's really growing up a lot, a lot of things are going around, and one thing which has really brought us together is we have a big cooperative agreement, as Brett mentioned, Artemis, where about 30 faculty members involved, a lot of projects and things. things. But let's show how big is robotics is, and how we're growing, we have, a lot of you know, master's program with about 250 students, graduate master's and thing. 30, 30 plus faculty member doing what we call research, huge spectrum, which I cannot cover. A couple of years ago, we also started a minor in robotics. So you could be a major in computer science, electrical computer engineering, mechanical engineering, or AE, but you take a minor. So that's, things that, that's how we're progressing. Now, so a lot of, lot of things are happening. Now, where is robotic as a field? You know, I would say vision is great, but vision is one component of robotics. You know, it's, it's a lot of other applications. I've been involved in robotics for about 35 years, you know, when I was an undergrad in India and how things have evolved. This is a golden era of robotics. How big is robotics? <clears throat> at many universities, like people have now, people started starting Carnegie Mellon started Robotic Institute in the late 70s. You know, a lot of research institutes or Maryland centers. In the last five years, many college of engineering are having a department of robotics. Just like your Department of Computer Science, your Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, people are forming Department of Robotics just to tell you how broad robotics is. Many universities are offering undergraduate majors in robotics. So that just tells you, you know, 
how big it is, that you could just get a degree just like computer science, physics, math, and join majors. So this is what robotics is here. Now, why is it good to be robotics? Now, Narendra did a great job of giving, you know, 50 years history uh, of robotics. Robotics as a field, you know, first robots were about 1961, you know, animation, and they were really deployed in General Motors. So a lot of times they were used in industry, like for painting and welding jobs. They were doing some great tasks, but robotics were what we call not intelligent. Just like, you know, you got a music in your iPod, you play the same song again, to the motion they were doing. Now, in the last 20 decades, besides, of course, industrial automation, if today you order a package from Amazon, right? How many of you shop at Amazon? There's a robot involved because Amazon is deploying half a million robots in their warehouse. Okay? And if Jeff Bezos had a very ambitious project, he wants robot deliver your packages because they're spending more than $30 billion a year on, on delivery fees. Can we, can we do it? Now, I hope you get a chance. Weather is getting better. We have some robotics demos for you. We are partnering with Amazon. They have a lab 126, a robot called Astro. How many of you have seen Astro video? We are, we are the first one to get it, and we'll be showing them at the robotics lab. It's a home robot Amazon is selling for $1,500. They're running slow. But let me tell you, it's not just a vacuum cleaner. It's much more than a vacuum cleaner. It doesn't do vacuum cleaner job. It's a companion robot with all kind of stuff happening there. But making a robot work in your home is a very difficult problem. Because I will just say, in this building, we have about 50 computer science faculty, more than 50. Most faculty office, including yours truly, are messy. OK? And guess what? Everybody's mess is different. So this robot has to go and deal with the mess. Everybody's layout at home is different. Lighting is different. Furniture is different. Curtains are different. How to build a robot in everybody's home? But Amazon is spending a big project, and Malin is one of the first partners with them. Along with Army, we are working on, as Brett mentioned, ground and real autonomy. If you go to the lab that, that Brett is heading, it's one of the biggest labs. They have Grace's Quarter, outdoor robotics. They got all kind of challenging environment. Imagine you go hiking, right? How do you figure your way out? There's vegetation like this. So the field of robotic is a place right now what I call, if the environment is structured, like industry. Now, when Amazon built warehouses, they made them robot friendly. They could right lighting, they put light sensors, marks, and they made sure they're not any humans. Okay, at least in the big warehouses. Now, I was telling Ben and Nareeb this morning, you know, this is one of the best computer science buildings in the world, but guess what? As of 2023, I labeled this building as not robot friendly. You know why? You got all this glass, right? Computer vision still doesn't work on grass. One thing computer vision cannot do well. So we're entering an era, you know, we're building home with sensing. Robots are coming in our, fire, our life in all kinds of form, in your cars, in your homes, in your warehouses, in the stores. You can see it. Are we ready? Are we building infrastructure? Because I think five to 10 years from now, we'll be coexisting with robots, maybe 10, 15, you know, these are hard to predict. But is our environment robot ready? So this is coming like, so we're entering an era, robots are entering our life, you know, how it's going to change our lifestyle, this thing. So tell you one experience I had, worked with Amazon. Amazon had a lab, you know, two bedroom apartment, they were testing Astro, like 10 Astro robots. They test robot in your kitchen, in your dining room, in your living room, in your bedroom, in your closet. They asked me a question, among all the rooms you have in your home, which is the most difficult one for robots? Anybody wants to make a guess? Kitchen. How many of you think kitchen? Raise your hand. No. Bedroom? No. Garage. Bathroom? Yeah. Now, why do you want a robot in the bathroom? That's a separate question. <laughs> But that's not my job. I'm a geek, OK? They're putting sensors. Why is it hard? You got very specular lights. You got mirrors. And you got a shower door with a glass. So see now? That's where things come up. So the kind of situations come up. I mean, when you enter the old apartments, you know, enter like old apartment, they're like closets with big mirrors, shiny objects, lighting. 
So one challenge we're all facing is a lot of research happening in Maryland, a lot of colleagues. We have a huge number of people, you know, colleagues, 30 plus people solving robotics problem in this area. So this is what's happening. But this, as I said, I've been around for 35 years. This is, I would say, the golden age of robotics. A lot of funding is going around, a lot of, lot of consumer products are coming. And I think in 10 years, again, I, I hope I'm not wrong, our lives are going to change one way or the other because robots are entering it. Just like if you think smartphone change your life, you ain't seeing anything. Robots are going to do it more. Thank you. Thank you, Dinesh. All right. Um, our last panelist is um, An Ani. Um, are you ready, Talk? Can we share the screen with him? Yes. Remo? So I'm going to actually build upon what uh, Dinesh spoke about, which is really robotics, but really at the intersection of robotics, uh, vision, and graphics. And I'll keep it quite short. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the uh, grand goals, you know, at the intersection of these fields is really to create household robots that work in chaos, right? And so when they work in chaos, what I mean is they work on kitchens like this, like Dinesh was talking about. Um, where you want to navigate, you want to manipulate, you want to communicate. And um, we want to create these robots that work in everyone's houses. This is one of the sort of goals, like grand North Stars in vision and robotics. And this is the way a lot of uh, robotics uh, learning has been traditionally taking place. And this is not very scalable, right? Because you have to have armies of robots trying to learn very, very basic tasks. And this is slow, expensive, dangerous. But in vision and in language, right, scaling data and scaling models is really starting to uh, show fantastic results. So what is the parallel in robotics? How do we get from, you know, small scale learning to really massive scale uh, uh, learning so that we can create generalized systems that can work in everyone's homes? And today I wanna to shine the light on lots of exciting work that has particularly amplified in the last 10 years. And that is training and simulation. And so training and simulation is not new, it's been around for decades, but really with the advancement in game engines, we can now have fast simulators, cheap simulators, where you can interact with objects which have photorealism with some degree of physical realism as well. And the minute you get into simulation, you get so much data for free. You can get all kinds of metadata and auxiliary signals. You can augment your scenes. You can add objects, remove objects, and so on. And really, you can really start scaling up robot learning. And the, the thing that excites me most about simulation is really you can start doing end-to-end -end learning, just like the success stories in vision and in language. Right? And so you can use neural networks to input merely visual observations and some instructions in language, and then you can train these systems end to end. And these days, a lot of our success stories in robotics are stories where you don't need any human supervised data. You can use reinforcement learning with rewards given by the simulators, and then you can start solving some tasks that were you know, fairly out of reach just a few years ago, particularly when you want these robots to generalize to everyone's houses. And so I think robotics and vision has really taken a leap uh, uh, in, in this regard with regards to the amount of data and the size of what you can do. But we're still many years behind. Uh, when I was a graduate student, we used to work with Caltech 101. I would say robot learning in terms of scale is still um, you know, in the Caltech 101 scale. And so how do we get to internet scale, right? How do we create environments in the millions so that we can really scale up simulation? And I'm gonna say that one of the ways we can do this is procedurally generate data, right? And so without going into a lot of detail, you can start with saying, I want to create a one bed, one bath apartment. And you can use procedural generation. You can use the latest advancements in LLMs, language models, and really create these scenes automatically. And so this is what procedural generation is looking like in the last one or two years. You can have millions and millions of houses and then you can start training robot policies. And we're seeing large improvements in this era. Of course, another thing that you can do because 3D reconstruction is getting better, sensing is getting better, vision is really starting to work so well, is you can not do sim to real, but you can do real to sim. And that has been quite exciting. You can take out your cell phone, any cell phone that you're available in the market, you can scan your room, you can transfer it into simulation. 
And what this allows you to do is get a robot from Best Buy and you want it to work in your house, you can scan your house and then you can fine tune your model. You can just say fine tune on, on a button on your robot and suddenly your robot can start learning in simulation, but a simulated version of your environment. And so, for example, this is a simple scan of a room on the left. And what we are able to generate is this beautiful simulation. And now you can start doing real learning with objects, with people in it, and so on. And so um, I'm going to end by saying that simulation can be a huge uh, boon to us. Um, physical realism is not yet fully there, but we're slowly getting there. And I think uh, there are some very exciting directions uh, that we can work on the next few years to make uh, sim to real uh, a real success. And I'll end there. Thank you, Ani. Okay, so um, for those of you who are starting for the next panel, we started about 10, 15 minutes late because of ice cream social. Um, so we're gonna take another five, 10 minutes. Yes, question. How many years do you think we are away from having robots that can clean a bathroom or wash dishes as well as a human to the point where it would be as prevalent as laundry machines? Basically, laundry machines, everybody uses a laundry machine. Nobody washes their clothes manually anymore. OK. Any other panelists? So how many, when we're going to see a ton about robots? You know, a lot of us grew up watching science fiction movies, right? When are we going to have a fully autonomous car? This is a question media ask. And you know, whatever success we're seeing, everybody talks AI. You know, the real like even you heard some of your dinner last night. This is AI 3.0. You know, with machine learning. Strictly speaking, we don't really have uh, AGI, general intelligence capability. So. I won't answer that question because I have no clue. I hope it happens in my lifetime. But one of the things we have done in AI and robotics, time and again and again, we underestimate the complexity. And you know, Elon Musk, multiple, 15 years ago, he promised us fully autonomous cars. 10 years ago, fully autonomous cars. Five years of fully autonomous cars. By this time, in fact, I'm teaching a robotics class right now, uh, undergrad and grads, and I ask this question. If a kid is born today, Will this kid ever get a driver license? <laughs> I don't know the answer. So I hope it happens in my lifetime, but I'm not going to taste a number and make a fool of myself because the problems are hard. Well, remember bathroom is the hardest place in your home. <laughs> if you tell me washing the kitchen, I'll be more optimistic. I wish I could give you a number. It's it's a hard problem. I don't know. Anyone else want to attempt? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Ani? Yeah, I would say that, um, you know, the robot that Dinesh was talking about, the robot from Amazon, right? It sort of walks around and it talks to you. I think before we see uh, robots washing our dishes, I think um, we'll probably see robots in every house that can navigate and communicate. And that's because I think deformable objects, liquids, articulation, I think this these are still, I think we're still a while away from solving these problems. Navigating in chaotic environments, I have a lot of hope for that we'll see sooner than later. Um, of course, it remains to be seen, we, you need creative ways of making these robots really useful without having them pick up objects. Uh, but I think that will be the first phase of uh, general deployment. Okay. So when I have someone come into my home and they want to help dry the dishes, they say, where does this go? And I tell them. So I get the simulation thing, but that doesn't work. Uh, what about, you know, some interaction with a human where, with the robot? Do you do that? Do you look at that kind of learning?
Uh, yeah, so we, we do a lot with that. So we don't do we don't do that problem. But an example of what we do is uh, one of the things that we need to do is drive through heavy vegetation, right? So traditionally, robots, uh, tall grass is an obstacle and expensive robots, bad, don't go through it, right? But we know as humans, if we go off roading at all, we go through very complex environments. We push through brush, we go through overhanging trees, right? And it's very difficult for the robot systems to learn that and learn that in simulation environments. So we do a lot with human learning from human demonstration and translating that into robotic systems. So yeah, we do a lot of that. So, so I, would, I would also mention- Both, right? Right. So, so there could be cases where the human does it, take that offline, build data sets and build from that. But there could also be the human driving the robot, teleoperating the robot. So the robot is learning with the human input or the human is correcting to say this is good behavior or bad behavior. So there's a lot of different ways that that can happen. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, I was going to say that uh, although I, I talked a bit about uh, the ocean, the underwater part of ocean robots, uh, there's a lot of work on uh, the human machine interaction side, in, particularly in the maritime world, it turns out it's very uh, generally applicable. I mean, uh, it turns out that 50 to 100 large ships are sunk every year. Uh, and that's usually due to, uh, uh, you know, basically human errors on the bridge, usually bridge management. I mean, the big success in aviation, it's partly airplanes are better, but also cockpit management is a lot better. And so it turns out uh, one of the things that we've been finding, and we have a big uh, project with, we've been working on with the Armstrong, uh, Institute, which is all about improving surgical outcomes, is that uh, is that actually uh, understanding uh, the primary failure modes in the surgical suite and when to intervene uh, turns out to be a very high leverage, uh, a very high leverage activity. And so I, I think that human and it and it takes you very deeply into sort of theory of mind type things. Uh, you know, why is a person doing what they're doing? Are they tired? Uh, are they hungover? Uh, you know, are they depressed? Uh, so there's a, a series of very interesting things that I think come out of that AI interaction with, uh, with humans. So Dinesh, you didn't want to stick your neck out, but I'm going to do a little bit of it by saying that I don't know when it'll happen, but I think uh, before the robot is able to robot will be able to get to the dishes before it is able to you know satisfactorily handle the dishes and find out you know it'll know where the thing is stuck food is stuck but to actually have the skill of cleaning it and and putting it back i think that'll come later okay great we have one more question hi uh, my name is siva uh, so now we have advanced drones with vision taking pictures where humans are not able to take pictures. We, we all have seen that. So my question is, um, some countries, they do a lot of human rights violations and there's mass deaths happening. Um, how do you see, I guess this, this is a question for the army person as well. Uh, there's also a policy involved, of course, but how do you see the, the robotics drones being able to take pictures and transmitting where in some countries where journalists uh, disappeared, like in Sri Lanka, journalists were disappeared. They were not jailed, they were disappeared. So how do you see that in the sense of preventing mass atrocities and genocide, of course? Thank you. I think you're asking a very difficult question about AI and ethics, right? And good use of technology. So that's a question, but I'll tell you, the part I can answer, I have actually won the project funded with ARL, where we're adding perception to drones, but imagine there's like an earthquake or hurricane, right? And the casualties. So we want to fly a drone and find any human like unconscious. So it's a good humanitarian cause. We actually have a project going on this building on this thing funded by ARL. So there's a lot of good user technology, you know, that there's a natural disaster or earthquake, and fine. In fact, some of us looking for, you know, this all this year, our life has been hit by wildfire. We're getting bad air in DC. There's a competition man is putting up a team, X Prize. Could a drone fly and detect wildfires? You know, that's a huge technical challenge. 
But one thing that happens all these technologies, you know, see that that's a problem which keeps us awake at night. They're very interesting problems. Of course, we all want to see good use of technology and ethical question comes up with everything, right? Even chat GPT can do crazy things. So I think with all these technologies, the AI technologies, there are so many wonderful humanitarian uses. We want to work on that. And we just hope that nobody misuses that. Mm. That's our talk. But ethics is becoming a very important topic. People are saying every computer science major should get a class in ethics. Your question is well taken. I'll just add that, yeah, I'm not going to necessarily answer the question directly, right? I think that's a, a, a big problem, right? And it's one that we need to be aware of. I'll just let you know that, that we, we do look at ethics and how robots are used and what's the role of the human and when autonomy can be used, when it can't be used. Those are all things that are being considered uh, when we're looking at the re research that we're doing. Okay, great. I'll say that uh, the applied physics lab, where, where I spend a fair bit of time, uh, worries about uh, sort of the, the, the problem that Dinesh uh, brought up, which is, uh, can you trust the data you're getting? Uh, and uh, but that both involves, uh, both involves, uh, uh, well, for example, early in the uh, invasion of the Ukraine, um, there was an enormous amount of publicly available data from traffic cams, from uh, from you know uh, public you know open source uh, radio intercepts and things like that. And you have to ask the question in in uh, in this this day and age as to whether or not that information you're getting uh, you can actually believe. And so I think as we go forward, uh, that is that's going to become a big problem, not just in information we're getting from other countries, but information information in our own country and so i think a, a lot of uh, a lot of the focus that or I, I won't say the focus because i don't think anyone has answers but a lot of the concerns uh that i hear voiced are about uh, understanding that you know and, and assuring that information integrity uh, including to you know potentially real-time communications so so uh, is your question about detection and mitigation or only detection of such things Basically, detection and mitigation yeah. and preventing mass, mass genocide. Right. Okay. So I, I, I think I, I would say that I would say that uh, uh, you may not be observing the event directly. You know, some journalist being taken away or things like that. But I think you can probably look for the indirect evidence by detecting anomalies in in ob your observations, which might seem harmless otherwise. But then you can backtrack them to some causes, and one cause might be this. In other words, I see somebody at this place all the time. Now I don't see it, so there is something to 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 ex explain. And there are many other correlates of things that you're after, but not, maybe not directly, but indirectly. Okay. Okay. Ani, do you have any other comments? No, I'm good. Okay. Great. All right, we're running uh, pretty much up the time. I want to thank our panelists um, for incredible, insightful comments and your presentation. And we're going to end right here and going to transition immediately to the next panel. That is a panel on AI. Thank you all. Thank you.